Hello guys, so we're moving on to question nine now. Okay, question nine is quite a tricky functions question. And admittedly, this is like the ninth time I have recorded this video. So let us just continue. Okay, so it says in the diagram below, the graphs of f of x equal a x to the power of three plus b x squared plus c x plus d. This is a cubic graph. You should be able to identify this because this is the general form, okay? It's important to be able to identify functions from the equations, okay? And then here it says, and gx, which is a hyperbola. You should be able, again, to identify it from the equation. Then it says, e is a point of intersection of the graphs f and g. So we know that that's a point of intersection, right? Then it says, f is the point of inflection of f. Remember, when we say point of inflection, right, what we mean is that the second derivative of f equals zero. Okay, that's what we mean. Okay, so let's now go and see what other information they've given us. I've just put the cubic in pink and I've put the hyperbola in orange, right? And the other scribbles around it, I'll come back to as we get into the question. Okay, so the graph of f cuts the x-axis x axis at x equals one over two. So it's saying that's an intercept, right? This is an x intercept. It says touches at x equals negative three. That's a turning point or a stationary point. Um, and cuts the y axis at nine. So that is a y intercept. Okay, so they've given us quite a lot of information there. And again, I say this all the time, but they don't just give you information just because. They want you to leverage it. Okay, so it's important to remember that. Let's now get to the first question. It says, show that A equals negative 2, B equals negative 11, C equals negative 12, and D equals 9. Okay, so what they're asking is they're effectively asking you to find the coefficients of each of these different um, degrees of X and the constant, which is D. Now, we know that D is the y-intercept, right? We should always remember that, right, for a cubic. So we know that d is going to equal 9, okay? We know that from the graph, but we can test it another way, okay? So don't worry about that, right? So it's basically saying, like, because we have this point 0 and 9, which is the y-intercept, right? We could plug that into here, right? And basically all of those would become 0. This would just become uh, uh, d, it would just stay d, and that would equal 9. So d would equal 9. Okay, so that's one that you can get quite quickly, but the others, we're going to have to do a bit of legwork. Okay, so what I've done here, right, is I've written out the factorized version of a cubic graph. And this is important. And if you don't know this form of a cubic, I would go back to your notes, right? And if you don't have this in your notes, maybe Google it, right? But this is a factorized version of this cubic here. Okay, so what each of these means these x1, x2, and x3. Those are generally the three intercepts that we see in a cubic graph. But now, you're probably saying, Margie, there is only one x-intercept or one turning point, so we're in a bit of a difficult situation. And you would be correct, right? But what we do, when we have a turning point and an intercept, we use the turning point twice, so it'll be x1 and x2. And it doesn't really matter what order you put it in. You can make it x1 and x3. So don't get the way laid by that. And then the other x, the other x that you haven't used will be a half. Okay, and we put that in there. So just remember when we put an intercept or a turning point in this case into here, we put the opposite sign. Okay, because we're saying the x-intercept equals negative 3, but we want to write it in this form. So bring it to the opposite side, change the side. Okay, that's very important. So you'll see here, I've said a, x plus 3, x plus 3, x minus a half. So I've literally just input what I've explained to you. Then here, what I've done is I've said, well, we have a point, and we know that this point um, is 0 and 9, because that is the y-intercept. So I plug that in, right? And I have solved for a. Okay, do you see that, right? So, and we get a equals negative 2, which is fantastic considering that they asked us to solve for that okay so we've got that and now you could be saying okay that's all good and well marks but like how do we continue so what we do is we go back to the original form we had but now we sub in what a is and all we have to do is expand out right and get it into a cubic form that looks like this and then we can get all the different unknowns so 
What I did first is I multiplied x plus 3 by x plus 3, and I got this bracket. So you might be saying, Moggy, well, why aren't you writing this out for us? But the tricky thing here is not necessarily the solving, right? What I don't, I don't want to necessarily show you how to like times x by x. I want to show you how to approach a question. Okay, so what you must do here is I'm showing you the approach. You can go and do this algebra and check it against mine, right? To make sure that you agree with me. But this is what I'm doing. I've calculated that. Then I multiplied by that last bracket. I've times it out there. I've then simplified it, right? So that I've joined like terms. Remember, like terms is where we have the same degree. So like the x squares we put together and the x's we put together, the constants together. And then I'm going to bring in this negative 2. Okay, because that's outside the bracket. Bring it in, and then what? Oh, look, we get exactly the form we want. And now we can just read off, right, which is fantastic, our different values for all these different unknowns A, negative 2, B, negative 11, C, negative 12, D, 9, which we knew already, but we've just confirmed again. So that is how you go about this. It's five marks, right, which is quite a lot, but it's not too difficult, right, if you know this form of a cubic graph. So that's the big learning for this question. Okay, let's now go to the next question. Okay, I must admit that um, I uh, actually was doing this last night and um, then I couldn't do it. I got stuck and then I actually had a bit of a cry. But anyways, I have now pulled myself towards myself and let's continue. So it says, determine the x coordinates of f, right? So let's just go back and look at what f is. So if they said was the point of inflection. So what they're testing is they're testing whether you can use the information they've given you and display understanding of what that information means. So I've, wrote, I've written out the f of x equation. I've got the first derivative because we have to get the first derivative before we can get the second derivative. Then I've got the second derivative. Okay, and now you could be saying, Margs, it's too fast, you're losing me. Yes, remember, what I want you to do is just remember how to actually um, get the derivative, right? So remember, we take the exponent, we multiply it by the base, and we subtract from the exponent. That's what I've done there. Then I've applied that same process again, 2 times 6, negative 12, taken away 1, and then negative 22 because I just dropped the x. Remember, when there's a constant, when we differentiate a constant, we get 0. Then, remember I said to you, a point of inflection is where the second derivative equals 0. So set this equal to zero, and then you just solve for x, and that is fantastic, right? And you've finished. Just a little recap of what a point of inflection is. Draw a little picture here. It's where the gradient goes from being concave to convex, okay? Or it can actually be the other way, I think, as well. So it's, it, it's just where it changes from convex to concave or concave to convex, okay? So it's basically that, that shift, right, between the two. Now, this is very important to note because we're going to need this in the second question. So what I want you to do is I actually want you to write that into your calculator and write it in decimal form. Now, you could be saying, why do I need that? You'll see now. I'll show you. Then it says, if the gradient at point E of the graph of f of x is 8, determine the coordinates of E. So what we're saying is we're saying the gradient at E, right, which is the point of intersection between these two graphs, it equals 8, the gradient. Now, what they're testing is whether you can remember that the first derivative equals the gradient, right? So I've said, okay, the first derivative, as calculated over here, okay, equals 8. Then I've brought the 8 over, divided through by 2 just to simplify it, and then I'm like, oh, there's... A lot of stuff going on here. What am I going to use? Ah, my good old friend, the quadratic formula. Remember, negative 3 is A, negative 11 is B, negative 10 is C. Okay? Remember, when you have, don't get like really like phased about the quadratic formula. It is given on the formula sheet. Okay? So, you can go to the formula sheet, write that down, plug in those values. Remember, this plus and minus. You should get two values for your value of X. Right? You get two different options. So, now... We have two options, okay? One is negative 2, and the other one is negative 5 over 3, when I put it into my quadratic equation. Now, you're probably saying, well, Margie, now, how do I know which one is for point E? And that's a great question. Well, let us just write this negative 5 divided by 3 as a decimal, okay? 
okay? So it's negative, point, negative 1.6 recurring. Now, let's go back to our graph and see what we know. Okay, we know that the x value here of f, we've just calculated that in the previous question, is negative 1.83 recurring, okay? But we see from the graph that e is actually to the left of f, right? So it has to be smaller than f. Because remember, we talk about negative numbers. So it actually has to be smaller than f. So it can't be that side of f. It has to be this side of f, okay? So that gives us a very good clue as to what we need to do. So negative 1.6 is actually that side of f. So it can't be that guy. It has to be negative 2. Okay, and this is a really interesting question because what happens is sometimes we forget that the graphical representation of the function is also helpful in answering questions. And this is a point in, that is a point that actually substantiates that explanation. Okay, so it's negative two. Fantastic, they've asked us for the coordinates, right? So we need a y value as well. Let's sub negative two into our f of x, which I've done there, okay? Put that into your calculator or do it in your head. I would generally advise to put it into your calculator just because sometimes in exams, our brains are a little bit of a fuddle. So let's just be double, doubly sure. And then we get E. So E is negative two and five. Okay, tricky question that one actually, even though it was only for three marks, it was one that actually completely floored me last night and then came to me, okay? But I just want you to really understand the different tools we can use when we do questions like this. Let's now go to C. Okay, so it says, if the graph of G has a vertical asymptote, right? So that means like this, remember? Vertical asymptote. And remember an asymptote, it means the function gets close to that point, but never actually touches it, right? Okay, then it says, at the minimum stationary point of F. So what is the minimum stationary point of F? It is negative three, because that's the maximum stationary point, right? The one up there. But the negative three is the minimum. So effectively, let me just make sure you can see what I'm doing here. This line here is our asymptote of G at negative 3. Okay, not a problem. It says determine the equation of G in the form y equals 2 over x plus p plus q. So effectively, all we need to do is find p and q. But they've actually just given us p, right? Because they've said we know that p is actually the vertical asymptote. So, if we know that the vertical asymptote is at x equals negative 3, we just bring it over so that it's the right form, so it's x plus 3, and we just hoi it into the equation. Okay, so we have that. So, all we need to do now is solve for q. Now, you could be saying, oh, no, how does one do that? Ah, but what do we know, guys? We know that f of x and g of x intersect at point e. So if we sub point E into this, we can then get the value of Q, okay? So that's why, and this is why I always say this in my videos, it's important to do questions in order because they help you with the questions to follow, okay? We see that all the time here, right? If you hadn't done the question before, you wouldn't be able to do the question coming next, okay? So here, we sub an E, and I've subbed that into where it needs to be, negative 2 in there, 5 there, solve it, Q, and Q equals 3, and then just write it in the equation form. Okay, so this one is the, what they're testing is your understanding of asymptotes and your understanding of what intersection means. Okay, so let's keep going.